You are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now present the Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi. Welcome to the Health Hub on Radio Maria Canada, exploring cutting-edge health and wellness information and therapies, helping you to take your health to the next level. I am your host, Kathy Biasse, and I'm a holistic nutritionist and a professional cancer coach. Today on the Health Hub, our guest is Maggie Jackson. She is an award-winning author and journalist whose new book, Uncertain, The Wisdom and Wonder of Being Unsure, has been nominated for a National Book Award and named to multiple Best Books of 2023 lists. Her book, Uncertain, has been called timely, groundbreaking, and a provocative exploration of the surprising benefits of not knowing. In this show, Maggie clearly elucidates how research strongly advocates that learning to live with uncertainty can cause us to grow learn, and experience life while navigating the unknown. Maggie Jackson is an award-winning author and journalist with a global reach. Her new book, Uncertain, The Wisdom and Wonder of Being Unsure, explores why we should seek not knowing in times of flux. Uncertain has been lauded as incisive and and timely, surprising and practical, and remarkable and persuasive. Jackson's acclaimed book, Distracted, sparked a global conversation on the steep costs of fragmenting our attention. A former columnist for the Boston Globe, Maggie has written for the New York Times and many other publications worldwide. Her work has been translated into multiple languages and is widely covered by press worldwide. She lives in Rhode Island and New York City. When I read Maggie's book, when I, I came up upon it and started researching for that, I was I just I knew it was somebody that I needed to have on the show because this whole idea of having to know everything all the time right away is it's, it's too much. It's too much for us to live with. Allowing ourselves to not know everything and to go through the process. Of, of trying to find answers. I, I just think this information is something that we all really need to listen to. We talk about um, what uncertainty is and what kind of uncertainty she's actually writing about in her books. And we talk a lot about why it's a good thing um, that we, we don't be certain all the time. And we talk about why uncertainty can make us feel uneasy. And we talk about why scientists who study uncertainty call it a space of possibility. I really enjoyed my conversation with Maggie. I do hope that you will stay tuned. We will be back in just a few minutes to speak with our guest, Maggie Jackson. You are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now continue with the program, The Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi. Welcome back to our show. Please do note that our show has been taped, so no opportunity for calling in. We would love for you to follow us on our social sites. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and we are at the Health Hub RMC on those locations. Maggie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. 
Your book, um, I think it should be read by everybody as a as a basis for solid mental health. Because as I was going through going through it all and going through our prep for today, I the one thing that I felt was this overwhelming ability to take back a breath, <laughs> to take this notion of calm when we're talking about uncertainty. Um, before we get into the, the meat and potatoes of the book and your research and everything, it's probably best here for you to delineate what type of uncertainty you are writing about and what type you're not. Sure. Yes. Uh, well, experts now basically think with a little debate that there are two kinds of uncertainty. Uh, so first of all, there's what's called aleatory uncertainty, and that is just simply the unknown. Uh, that's the shorthand for the unknown. So when you see the headline in the paper, you know, uncertainty roils the stock markets or uncertainty in the politics, political situation, that's a really a shorthand for what we cannot know as humans. We might have probabilistic reasoning, et cetera, to get a toehold on likelihood about whether something will happen. But um, really, there's so much that we really don't know, you know, whether the storm will drop four or six inches of snow on our backyards. Um, and so in complement, there is the second kind of uncertainty. And that's really the subject of my book is epistemic or our uncertainty, psychological uncertainty. And that's really all about the human response to the unknown. Uh, so when you meet something new or unexpected or the storm is coming or you're in a traffic jam, you basically can recognize that you've reached the limits of your knowledge. That's what uncertainty is. You know, it could go this way, it could go that way. You're not sure. Uh, this is not ignorance. It's really, um, you know, having knowledge but reaching the limits of that knowledge. So that's really what I'm writing about. And, and while we can't uh, completely control the world out there, we can gain skill in our response to the unknown, in how we navigate and harness uncertainty. Do you think we're on an endless pursuit of always wanting to know the answers to things? And is that counterintuitive to where your research is pointing us? Yes, very much so. I think uncertainty, our uncertainty has been swept under the rug and considered not really even worthy of study in psychology, believe it or not. Uh, it's been uh, shelved or hidden or treated as shameful in the business world, in medicine, uh, in even in the sciences uh, to some extent, um, you know, with a more emphasis on concrete results and, and ROI and return on investment and things like that. So I think that it's time now to really unpack and understand uncertainty. And we're lucky that basically there is a new scientific explosion of research regarding uh, how the neural workings of uncertainty, and most importantly, the benefits of unsureness. So basically, in a nutshell, we've got it all wrong. Uh, we treat uh, in uncertainty as inertia and weakness and something a leader should never exhibit when actually there are there's so much not just personal wisdom but uh, you know basically uncertainty is linked to performance gains it's really the marker of the of the better kind of student it's really what the nimble agile executives uh, know what to do and so uh, there's it's just a really important time and you know there are a lot of roots to why I think we've wound up in an, in an, a certainty centric culture, an outcome oriented or fixated culture. And they're long, they're deep, they're historic. I mean, first of all, efficiency, especially in Western capitalism has been, um, you know, venerated. So everything that was fastest and most efficient uh, seems to be better. And now we're seeing and questioning, I think, as people and in society, um, that, uh, you know, kind of narrow way of thinking. Um, you know, sometimes the fastest way to be or operate or relate to someone is not always the best. And um, again, also technology, and I mean, even since the industrial age, has also 
basically defined what it means to know or what is success in thinking. Uh, so just for an example, daydreaming was not considered a waste of time or a negative until the industrial age, when then it became seen as idleness and so uh, something that we should never be doing. Um, and actually the science shows us that simply daydreaming is not only really important for planning your life, asking what if questions, uh, what, what, you know, how will the party go? What will my career goals be? Um, daydreaming is not a waste of time very often. And it's also related to executives, not only uh, networks of the brain related to not only to imagination and meaning making, but also to the executive brain. So um, daydreaming is not this mushy waste that we think it to be. That's just one example, but um, move forward to our current technological age. And, and you can just see the look, the feel, the flow of our days wedded to technology um, pushes us in the direction again of a diet of instant neat pat answers. I mean, that's just how the, computer and the internet look like. There's not really much room for the liminal and the gray. Uh, and so the studies show very much that's changing how we think and how we know. Um, you know, we Google answers the question for us even before we write the, out the question. It's giving us an answer even before we finish asking the question, which is something to consider. Um, most people take the first search result that comes to mind and don't look further um, just because Google is offering to us. 75% of posts on big, big sites like Reddit are not read before they are shared. And so we, we live in this immediate jump to conclusion, snap judgment, neat brief answers sort of life. And that has deep, deep costs. Whatever led you down the path to studying uncertainty? Was there a an aha moment? Have you always researched this? Or is, you know, is it a combination of things like the, the state of mental health um, as we see it now? How did you find this path? Well, it's a it's sort of a long, complicated story, but in brief, I actually was not writing a book about uncertainty. Um, this is my third book, and the second book is called Distracted, and it was about the erosion of attention in society, or you know, more positively, how to reclaim our focus in in this fragmented, speed driven world. Uh, and I, after that, I wanted to write a book about thinking because I thought, well, attention is a vehicle for getting somewhere mentally. So what kinds of thinking do we need today? And the first chapter was about uncertainty. I mean, not that I thought that uncertainty was really a jolly good thing. Like most of us, I thought it was sort of a, a kind of a space of bafflement that we should eradicate as quickly as possible. So once you got through uncertainty, then you came to the light. It was like a dark forest you needed to tread through and then you got to the light. Well, I couldn't have been more wrong. I poked my nose into the research related to uncertainty in all of those different disciplines I mentioned. And I found this new uh, explosion of science uh, that was showing how positive uncertainty is, not just for mental well-being, as you mentioned, but uh, you know, for decision-making in a crisis, for understanding a person whose politics you loathe. I mean, uncertainty is very related to open-mindedness, curiosity, to resilience, and wow, what are the cognitive skills that we need most in this time of upheaval? They're actually those, the, the you know, in, including resilience. Those are the cognitive skills we need most when life is unpredictable. So we shouldn't retreat from uncertainty and hide and cower in sure answers that are um, you know, not going to help us uh, sort of tune into change. Uh, we should really be leaning into and learning how to net, you know, harness our uncertainty. We need more, not less uncertainty. So that's how I came to write that book. I pivoted uh, and, you know, there were people along the way. I gave a talk early on in my research in this book on thinking and someone, um, you know, was sort of pointing me to different Buddhist ideas of thinking. Uh, and then an, an early editor read a couple chapters and, and said, wow, you're really writing a lot about uncertainty. And so there were like wonderful serendipitous um, ways in which I was sort of pushed almost reluctantly into writing a book on uncertainty, but I'm so glad I did. 
Well, when I saw the title, the, the title pulled me in first, then I started doing research on the book and, and learned about you. And I thought, this is somebody I need to go actively, actively see if they have the time to be on the show, because I think it is, it is an eye-opening perspective because uncertainty makes us uneasy, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. That's really the starting point. So going back to the moment when we meet something new and unexpected, um, we kind of feel caught short. And so our uncertainty, uh, you know, kicks in. Well, at that moment, the brain and the body kind of spring into action, because the brain and the body, rec particularly the brain, recognize that there's something new and, and we don't know and etc. Well, what happens then is a stress response. And so you might get classics if you're, you know, say you're in a traffic jam on your way to an important meeting and you don't know whether you're going to get there, you might get a, heart, a racing heart or classic stress symptoms like that. But at the same time, and this is you know, newly discovered by very recent neuroscience, there are remarkably positive changes in the brain. So for instance, your uh, focus sharpens and scientists call this curious eyes. So when you're uncertain, literally your focus is sharpening. And actually studies of doctors show that they're, when they're in a sticky clinical situation, they report that the discomfort of their uncertainty is related to heightened attention. So they're getting that stress response. Um, the second thing happens is, is that your working memory is bolstered. So you kind of remember more in the short term, uh, you know, you're on your toes. And then third, your brain, literally your neurons become more receptive to new data. So I call uncertainty a kind of wakefulness. Uh, and one neuroscientist told me uh, that when you're uncertain, that's the brain telling itself there's something to be learned. Um, because just to add one other little layer to this, uh, basically most of the time we do go through life on autopilot and that's natural. You know, you need to have expectations and assumptions that your office building won't move, you know, when you get there on Monday and that your kids will kind of look the same and, you know, you expect uh, you, that you know how to engage in a conversation or tie your shoes. We live in this life of great, great familiarity. And of course, uh, you know, just look at how it, within a, an hour or two of a meeting, everyone's, you know, sitting in the same chair and they'll come back to that chair at lunchtime. We, we love familiarity. But when you do meet something new, um, your uncertainty is your kind of yanking you. It's a, I call it the gadfly of the mind to basically move from routine to that you know, wakeful stance in which you can update your understanding of the world. And this is true even of creative kind of situations. So you might, the, the meaning something new might be something unexpected like a traffic jam or a memo from the boss, but it also could be meeting something new when you seek out uh, something innovation, you know, trying to brainstorm about the new twist to the product that you need to bolster sales. Well, then that that all of the above fits with the times when we're seeking to be curious and uncertain as well. It's the time to wake up to how the world has changed and what is out there that you haven't discovered yet. It's it's a really monumental moment in humanity when you are uncertain. It's also a, a monumental um, uh, thought piece for, you know, for this particular moment in time, from my point of view. Um, and, and you can certainly tell me that I'm absolutely wrong, but is, is, a, is uncertainty actually tolerated in our society now? Uh, or, or is this something that we have to sort of create a movement about? Oh, yes. Well, I think the answer is yes and no and yes and no. <laughs> we, are at a, we are at a really pivotal moment, I believe, when it comes to the human approach to not knowing. I mean, a really a seismic moment is what I write in the book. Uh, basically, we, we do have this incredible science that shows that, you know, uncertainty in all its modes and, you know, different modes of uncertainty from the daydream to deliberation in a crisis to open mindedness of tolerance and others that I and I talk about in the book, all of the new science showing 
what uncertainty is and how we can utilize it um, is just beginning to, you know, pop up and, and we need to understand that and think about it and spread the word, et cetera. Um, at the same time, you know, humanity does grow in a time uh, of great unpredictability, sometimes more, not less fearful. So we, I think the challenge is at this moment not to fall into the certainty and the sureness that have been a kind of facade, uh, you know, of humans. I mean, it used to be that we thought that the stars were fixed in the sky and not that many decades ago or generations ago, we used to think that the brain was set in stone in adulthood. And now we know neurogenesis um, occurs throughout from cradle to grave. And so basically we kind of are understanding as humans that maybe we don't know everything. Maybe, you know, there's more to know that maybe uncertainty is with us at all times. It's what's really important is to lean into it at this moment. And, and then thirdly, uh, as I mentioned before, there are these pressures to be certain, uh, which are just part of the fabric of the culture. Um, you know, technology does allow us to be instantly, you know, I put certainty in quotes, sure. And so again, uh, we have to be really careful not to uh, kid ourselves or fool ourselves uh, that certainty can be gained or that certainty is an answer uh, when really adaptability and curiosity and resilience are at the height of human thriving. And I'll just mention um, in child development, but also in human development, there's a concept called zone of predict, I'm sorry, zone of proximate development. And that's often used to describe that idea of scaffolding a child's learning. So the zone of proximal development is where the kid can be doing a kind of a hard puzzle and they might need a little help from their caregiver or teacher, uh, but they can basically do it. They just need a little uh, leg up from someone, the proximal development. That's the edge of what they know. Well, that's very true for all of humanity. That's actually, as scientists tell me, how learning occurs at the edge. So at the at the edge of what we know, and that's precisely what where uncertainty lies. So you don't want to be clinging to that island of your familiar knowledge because you're not going to be adaptive to the world, um, but nor do you want to be completely off in terms of in worlds and galaxies of ignorance, um, you know, or, or throw yourself in over the deep end. I, I'm, I'm not going to become an Olympic sailor or sail around the world if I've never even sailed before. Uh, learning is incremental. It's built on surprise. It's built on uh, the foundations of our uncertainty. You kind of scooped me on one of the questions I was going to ask about child development, but maybe we'll come back to that. But, you know, as you're talking, um, I, I get this idea in my head that once you become confident that being uncertain isn't a negative space, do you think that that ability to step back and allow yourself that idea of not knowingness, do you think that leads to tolerance? Well, um, tolerance of others? Of other people's ideas, of other people's opinions. Oh, yes, I really think so. I mean, there's a social side to uncertainty. Uh, and that's a very important thing to remember that while we want to, you know, be able to operate in uncertainty and be skillfully unsure by ourselves when we're wrestling with a problem or when we're daydreaming, et cetera. Uh, there are also ways in which we can be uncertain together. And it's astonishing how uh, important that is to good collaboration. Actually, uncertainty is that the root of good collaboration, not Absolutely. being in agreement. Uh, and so I think that that's one element of social side of the social side of uncertainty, uncertainty um, woven in or born of a mild, frequent conflict constantly, you know, being able to air differences uh, really puts groups, uh, you know, it, it, ahead um, versus being uh, in agreement, no matter how diverse your group is, if you're in agreement, um, which is, you know, where you want to end up, but that should not be the norm, um, that, that really makes us into lazy information processors. But in terms of tolerance, the kind of contentious, divisive, uh, you know, divisions that we face today, 
And uncertainty is very, very important there too. And so, you know, very often we're, and I call it talking to the mirror, our social circles have become more homogenous. We tend to talk less and less to people who are different than us. Uh, and then the more distance there is, well, the more, um, dis uh, you know, sort of misunderstandings occur. This, uh, this happens right even at the very first moment when you see a face and your brain unconsciously categorize whether that person is in group, like someone like you, or out group, someone who's other. This can be race, sports teams, you know, rival departments in a company, all kinds of differences. You categorize and that then you begin to, your brain begins to actually disregard, process more superficially, uh, less holistically, people from the out group. That's why, quote unquote, they all look alike. And really, there's the slippery slope toward discrimination and even dehumanization. Um, but one of the most profound and powerful strategies to overcome this kind of bias is built on uncertainty. It's called perspective taking, a kind of grandmotherly wisdom that says, well, try to understand, imagine their perspective, imagine what it what's like to be them. This is not about empathy and feeling. This is cognitive, seeing the world through someone's eyes. And when people do that, just a mere leap of imagination, they become more willing to work together, to be together, to engage. And, and that's where, you know, real mutual learning can occur. Uh, and so I just have to emphasize, if you're just perspective, taking the perspective of another, you really don't know if you're right or wrong. What you're doing is giving yourself a shot of that uncertainty. You're breaking through that categorization that's so powerful and you are kind of allowing yourself to start fresh. You see them as not a label, but as a textured person who you'd want to connect with. And then you are, you know, more willing to engage with them and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a really profound moment when not knowing and the, and, and, and also this technique is being used in real world efforts to lower hate. It's a foundational effort. It's a uh, perspective taking is, uh, is, as Socrates said, you know, isn't ignorance just the mistake of knowing that you th know, of thinking that you know more than you do? Uh, and and there, there it is. We categorize and we think we know and we don't. I think it's a liberating, profound thought. Everyone, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back to continue on our conversation with Maggie. You are listening to The Health Hub, here on Radio Maria Canada, a Catholic voice wherever you are. To contact us and be a part of the show, email thh at radiomaria.ca. We now continue with the program. Here once again is your host, Kathy Biasi. Welcome back to The Health Hub. Maggie, my mind is going, going, going. There are just so many positive ways. I, I just, I just see this information flowing, but there are people that are, that will always be intolerant of uncertainty, right? Those that think that answers need to be had. Um, how do we break down those barriers? How do we show a person this, you know, less stressful way of living within uncertainty? Sure. There are very powerful, proven now practical strategies that are being used in medicine and used in clinical psychology and used in, in, in different areas to actually help people become more uh, tolerant of uncertainty. Now, that's a personality trait. It's kind of like we're all more or less introverted uh, but you know we're all more or less tolerant of uncertainty. Uh, the people who are tolerant are more flexible thinkers. Uh, they're more bendable. They're in the pandemic, for instance, people who are tolerant of uncertainty were more accepting of the realities of the situation. Whereas those who are high in intolerance of uncertainty were more likely to disengage with life. Uh, you know, have substance abuse, engage in, in um, you know, denial. Uh, you can see, you know, people who are intolerant of uncertainty, who really have difficulties with uncertainty, uh, don't really know what to do with it. They see it as a threat versus a challenge. And uh, so the practical strategies uh, to bolster tolerance of uncertainty are simply 
biting off a little more of the unknown each day. I mean, basically kind of like uh, exposure therapy, just, uh, you know, try little things. Again, I'm talking about the edge of what you know, the, the zone of proximal development. Try little things like delegating more work or uh, try a new dish in a restaurant or, you know, go to a, a, a place for the weekend that you might not go to, you know, some sort of city that's a little gritty that you might not immediately go to. And so th by doing this, there are actually studies that show that people become less clinically anxious, but also their self-reported resilience uh, is, is rises. And that's very, very important. Little steps like that in 12 weeks of therapy, just based on bolstering uh, people's or lowering people's aversion to the unknown. Um, you know, uh, people who with intractable generalized anxiety disorder uh, had depression levels fall and the gains held for a year and their anxiety levels fell to within the range of the general population. Very stunning, important results. I mean, more work needs to be done, but we can all try this. I, for instance, uh, started becoming an open water four season swimmer in the pandemic. The pools closed. I moved up by the near the ocean. I go swimming with other people all winter long. And it is really, truly out of my comfort zone. I actually never like the cold and I don't particularly like waves. And it's my daily dose of uncertainty, I realized. And it's it spills over into the rest of my life. This daily dose of uncertainty helps me see that I can contend with the not knowing. And it's not that I'm, oh, I'm learning that the unknown, because you really don't know what the ocean's going to do, even if you've got the app <laughs> and the <laughs> surf app. Uh, you, you really don't know. It's not that you're learning, oh, this is not a disaster. I can do it. You're learning that there's a space of possibilities within uncertainty. Instead of assuming it's horrible, you know, we think you begin to learn that there are there's a space of possibilities. So I'd say bite off a little more of the unknown, um, and you will definitely gain the ability to navigate uncertainty. There, there's another area that is, um, you know, it's, it's always been there, but I'm hearing more talk about is the way we talk to ourselves, our self-speak when it comes to our mental health. I see such a bridge between embracing uncertainty and the way we speak to ourselves as to how much we really need to achieve. Now, I, I, this is not taking away from, yes, people need to have goals. They need to have um, you know, things to work forward to and, and hard work. But does self-speak come into this role of uncertainty at all? Yeah, it's a, it can very much. There are definite ways in which it can. Um, yes. Um, well, just for instance, very often we're very outcome orientation, outcome oriented in high performance situations, like giving a, a speech. And so your your mind definitely very often goes to fear of failure or what is the reward for doing this for slam dunking it. But by doing so, by being outcome fixated, you're actually removing yourself mentally from the process of doing a good yes. job. So that's called reward based distraction. It could, it's often very much fear of failure uh, in high level tennis tournaments. If a if the trophy is prominently displayed near the court the favorite begins to struggle. This is an analysis of 100 oh. top, top professional tennis tournaments. So one way in which self-talk comes into this is because top athletes use something called cue words to basically pull themselves back into the moment and to then be able to uh, utilize that arousal, that wakefulness of uncertainty that, you know, get on their toes, they use cue words. Now that's a little mantra, a personal phrase that anybody can develop for themselves. You can say, be now or focus. And that's proven to actually help people perform better because you just are, you know, pushing your attention away from, uh, you know, basically to fixate on fear of failure is getting ahead of yourself. You're not even getting, letting yourself be in the uncertainty enough to do a good job. And I found that very powerful. That's a really powerful. And in real world studies, keywords um, and also um, just learning that the other second uh, practical strategy is to remind yourself that the stress 
of the unknown is a good thing that it basically a sign that your body is preparing to equipping you to do well in this situation. Uh, so, you know, when your heart is racing or your you know brain is firing up, just remind yourself that that unease of uncertainty is actually a gift. That also helps us to live in the now a little bit more, right? Very much. It's really related to all of the lessons of mindfulness. Hmm. Now, okay, it, getting a little bit into the health space, um, a, a level of uncertainty can maybe give a patient with respect to the medical profession angst. But how do you see professionals, psychologists, doctors, embracing uncertainty as a way to move forward for the betterment of a patient? Will this lead to more integration, do you think? Oh, I think so. Very much so. I think it's a really important uh, part of medicine. And I know I've talked and interviewed with some le leaders, experts in the field. Um, it, there, you know, There's two ways in which uncertainty is very, very important. First of all, on the part of the clinician, the doctor, the healthcare provider, um, intolerance of uncertainty has been highly related to burnout, anxiety, and also to over-testing and over-diagnosis. So that's being looked at training um, young people and even older doctors and others to be more tolerant of uncertainty is seen as a very positive way now, a path to um, you know, improving medical care, basically. And, and this is true even of clinical psychologists. There's a lot, new, a lot of new, new attention uh, related to how therapists uh, try to hide their uncertainty and so end up not being as much a partner in care if they're trying to be the all-knowing expert. Uh, and that's it, this this the entire this whole work on a in uncertainty really changes what it means to be an expert instead of the all-knowing you know person on the throne handing down knowledge uh you 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 can be if you admit to uncertainty if you you know are are okay or realize it's not a a negative thing it's not a negative thing then you can actually um you know be more nimble and adaptable and and that's really important and and then as far as the patients um some of the studies that have been um going on related to resilience have been with people with multiple sclerosis or chronic conditions like that. Uh, you know, newly diagnosed or diagnosed within six months, people with multiple sclerosis uh, find that you know, training uh, in, in learning to accept uncertainty, learning that's not necessarily a negative, et cetera, are, are find that, that they gain resilience through that. That's very much important because, I mean, again, we can't, we have to Keep the distinction in mind between the uncertainty out there and all that we can't fully control. Uh, and, and it's sort of, if we try to, it's in vain. And then our uncertainty, our approach to the unknown, uh, which is something that we can really uh, strengthen and and learn to do with skill. It's a productive thing uh, to be unsure in so many ways. When you're talking about a disease or a health issue, what aspect of uncertainty are we going to hold on to? Because, I mean, in a That's very, a I, 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 if you can help us decipher that, that would be, um, that would be great. That's a really good idea because it's very important to, to emphasize that uncertainty, we don't want limitless uncertainty and we don't want uh, uncertainty with, uh, you know, our very survival. So it's natural to, first of all, know that you want and need answers. Humans are built to not need and want answers. That's why we do get a stress response. I mean, I think it's enlightening just to remind ourselves of that. Um, you know, it is it is uncomfortable to live without the understanding of whether or not your chemotherapy will work or not. But that doesn't mean that, you know, uncertainty is just a monolithic negative. There are so many ways in which you can, first of all, understand that uncertainty is a spur to, you know, doing a little more research or to being more wakeful when you're in the doctor's office, if you're present. Uh, it, it can also be, secondly, it's both a spur and, and it's also the space of possibilities. So all of the types of uncertainty that I'm talking about, that, you know, in terms of thinking are ways in which we
we can see multiple perspectives, see nuance. So your uncertainty is not necessarily a negative, but a part of the equipment with which you deal with um, you know, some of the larger uncertainties. And also, you know, no one would want, and this is often true in terms of people in lower economic conditions, or, you know, I think would be true in terms of very, very serious medical conditions. You know, you don't want uncertainty about your very survival. I mean, sometimes you can't change that uh, and, and that's okay, but there are limits to uh, what we we always want to work to help people survive. We always want to work to eradicate poverty or disease. And, and certainty is not just this limitless, wonderful, positive thing. There, are, I, it's really important to remember the guardrails around uncertainty. So, um, you know, that's that's really important. Um, but I I have found, and people have been reaching out to me who have serious medical conditions who found great solace in this new work, this new science of uncertainty, they too find it very liberating uh, to know, you know, how to um, inhabit the question uh, rather than retreat or be in denial or um, just live in fear. Uh, with when you when you can understand the wonders and the wisdom of uncertainty, you can live it with curiosity, resilience, uh, an engaged eye, mind, curious eyes, uh, instead of living in fear, which is basically a retreat. And and I also add that fear. I might have mentioned the racing heart, etc., the sweaty palms that might accompany uncertainty as arousal, but uh, the fear based. Um, reaction when when the human is facing something fearful or is fearful, I should say, that's a different physiological response. It's more of a shutting down your circulatory shuttles blood away from the extremities, including the brain when you're fearful. And so therefore, if you're fearful of the unknown, you're shutting down. If you can be uh, not fearful, but see the unknown and uncertainty out there as a challenge, not a threat, well, then you can perform, you can uh, operate, you can be, um, you know, able to uh, pick up on the possibilities and the, and the opportunities that are there. And it's not an, you know, it's not an elimination of fear, but it's more of a handling of a situation. Um, and that's, that's a distinction. Uh, there's always going to be fear when you're dealing with a crisis. And I don't think you're saying that you know, we're trying to eliminate that in general, but if we understand how to be uncertain, it, it gives us the path forward, which I think is great. Now you touched on something, well, you didn't touch on it. You went into a bit of depth about it, but I, I'd like to come back to it briefly before we end. Um, are we raising our children properly to embrace uncertainty? Uh, you talked about play. Um, you talked about going to the edge of where they need help, but how do we create uh, I don't know, the pillars of properly dealing with uncertainty as we are raising our children. Yes, uh, I think that's very, very important. Uh, and they are because of technology uh, and you know, in many other ways in, in our modern culture, um, you know, we have a negative attitude toward uncertainty and we should, um, you know, try to change that and, and basically, you know, watch how we talk and our language related to uncertainty. Um, even just, you know, talking about being sure, maybe we should dial back on the language related to it. Um, but there's also a concept called autonomy supportive parenting, which is getting a lot of recognition. I write about this in the book. And basically, that's the parent who knows how to support the child, but still foster their autonomy. So you're allowing them to uh, learn bit by bit, you know, step by step, how to cope with unknowns and the unease that they spark, but you're you're not performing the the challenge for them or or solving their problems, uh, but yet you're also there to be helpful. And this has been you know even in very 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 different cultures, um, collectivist sort of more uh, you know less individualistic cultures, you know Ghana, Indonesia. Uh, autonomy supportive parenting still is really important. So it's important in Western and in other cultures. Uh, autonomy supportive culture uh, is really allowing it. You can see even from what I've described, 
It's very much based on this kind of flexibility and bendability and curiosity. And one thing I always stress is that helicopter parenting is just seeking certainty in vain. And that is all going to lead to a kind of mistrust of your child. If you can, of course, be there for them, of course, give them guidelines, of course, keep them safe, but at the same time, allow them, trust them, give them autonomy, uh, you know, then you will be operating in a positive kind of uncertainty. And guess what? You'll learn more about who your child really is. You'll be, you'll be, Treating your child not with your assumptions, you know, treating them based on your assumptions, but based on who they are. So therefore, with curiosity. Uh, that's amazing. Um, so, you know, uncertainty is not a, a, this passive. I, I just want so everyone to be so very clear on this, uh, what Maggie has put forth in her book and what we're talking about now. Uncertainty is not this passive state to be in. It's it's very active, isn't it? It's an active, immersive place where we can challenge ourselves. It's not meant to be uh, a, a hard pass on doing things, right? Nicely. Oh, exactly. So, you know, just for an example, the surgeon in the operating room, uh, if they're a so-called routine expert, they're basing their you know, problem solving on what they've done in the past, you know, heuristic shortcuts. Oh, you know, he, the doctor hears um, sh- chest pains and thinks heart attack. Uh, you know, the surgeon sees a problem and think, oh, I, I know how to do that. And they're speedy, speeding right past what is actually a new and difficult problem. You know, that's routine expertise. Adaptive experts inhabit the question. You know, actually adaptive experts, the ones who know how to be unsure, are they spend more time diagnosing a new complex problem than even novices do. So they inhabit the question. They stay skeptical and curious even in routine cases when most people are complacent. And they also take on harder cases all the time. So they're constantly pushing the envelope of what they know, not just reapplying their knowledge again and again. So I think it's really important that, you know, that's a great illustration of wisdom, uncertainty as wisdom in motion. That's what I call it. It is, it, it, uncertainty is dynamic uh, when it's productive because the world is. And, and uncertainty allows us to be adaptable and adaptive because that's because we're actually not retreating from the world or up reapplying old certain answers from the past that don't fit the new moment. And so the surgeon and the expert who walks in the room knowing just what to do is going to be very impressive in routine, predictable environments, benign environments, the scientists say, but they actually begin to fail outside the quote comfort zone of their achievement. Uh, and I think it's so that really is a, a great illustration of how um, you know, uncertainty is wisdom in motion. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Uh, Maggie, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of the show. It's something it's it's a topic, you know, as you say things, other things are popping into my head. Um, but, you know, all in all, thank you for the gift of this book. I think it's uh, liberating. I think it's um, the path we need to be on. And it just, it's the answer to so many questions that are out there. Where can people get a hold of your book? Oh, well, they can, um, you know, most bookstores are carrying it now. It's available on bookseller sites from, uh, you know, bookshop to Amazon to Barnes and Nobles to wherever you, wherever you uh, find your books, you can find Uncertain. Thank you so much for that. Are there social sites that you can direct people to? Uh, yes, my website is probably a best resource. Lots of articles and uh, other interviews uh, with me on uncertainty. Uh, Maggie-Jackson.com. So Maggie-Jackson.com. Uh, but I'm also on LinkedIn and on Facebook too. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really have enjoyed the show and I thank you so much for offering up your time to us. Oh, thank you very much. Well, it's a it's a great time in the world to be unsure. Uh, and thank you so much for your all your wonderful conversation. Thanks, Maggie. Everybody, we'll talk to you next week on The Health Hub. You 
have been listening to The Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi. Here 